Hello and welcome all of you. Welcome Matthias. Um, I'm very happy that uh, quite a lot of you are here and not only interested in the IT topics but also in fundamental research. And before Matthias uh, now will tell us a bit about the some of the latest uh, developments in neutrino physics, um, I want to quickly introduce him. So it's more than 10 years ago during my PhD when I first met Matthias, um, I did my PhD in Mainz and he started with his uh, Emmy Noether research group there and also had a Lichtenberg professorship. In the meantime, he's a full professor in, at the University of Bonn. So as I knew him, I already knew that he has a, quite a broad interest in uh, fundamental particle physics, uh, precision physics in the weak interaction, and uh, also in detector development. I also knew that he won quite some awards in the meantime, uh, like um, research fellowships at the University College of London and MIT. And I knew that he um, filled some roles in the community, like being the collaboration chair of the phaser uh, collaboration, where he will tell us a bit about the results. What I didn't know, but I learned when I prepared for this introduction is that he also has a master's degree in computer science and even um, had a guest professorship at the University of Marburg for computer science. So when I looked in, in the CV and I had read all that, I asked myself, what is it that drives Matthias and that uh, makes him achieve all these things? And I looked a bit around on the website and in one of his uh, outreach videos, I found a citation that um, I think answers the question and probably also describes quite a bit of his personality. Um, I hope you don't disagree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let me read this citation to you. He said in this video, it is just so nice to understand things. It just makes me happy. If I understand something, then it's a joyful day. So Matthias, the stage is yours. Make us understand something. Make this a joyful day for all of us. <laughs> I must say that was the best intro I've ever got. So many, many thanks for this. Now I'm completely stumbled what to say. Um, let's see what I can teach you. May I ask who of you studied physics or has a physics background? I, uh, <laughs> I feared so, then the, the target audience is, is perfectly right. Um, this is more like a lecture than it is a talk. However, no worries for you who didn't study physics. I kept the level low. And in fact, um, I did my PhD here in Munich and my supervisor, Dorothee Scheile, um, she told me one thing which I completely didn't understand when I, when I was a PhD student. She said, Matthias, talks cannot be trivial enough. And nowadays I completely agree. If I hear a talk which I know already, I feel always thrilled that I'm so clever that I can follow the talks. Um, so I hope that at least some parts of my talk is trivial, then it's a good sign for me. Obviously some parts will be diving a little bit deeper. So actually the title of the talk and why I was asked to come here was the discovery of the neutrinos at the Large Hadron Collider. We got quite some media attention um, around this topic. I will introduce in the first 30 minutes that this actually was just media attention, there's not much science behind it. <laughs> Nevertheless, I hope to convince you the last 10 minutes and there's still some cool aspects about it. However, I, uh, uh, I, I named the title Bread and Butter Physics, Neutrinos and Gravitational Waves. So neutrinos is a topic where I was invited. Gravitational waves, I think, is a much cooler topic. Um, <clears throat> so still, I'm not yet decided what I will talk about. Either we'll do gravitational waves, which would be then black holes, axions, high-frequency gravitational waves, and a new idea of mine, um, a global network of gravitational wave detectors, or secondly, we talk as promised about neutrinos, so we discover or discuss what are neutrinos, phase experiment, dark photons, and the anti-tau neutrino. Um, so we have two options. In order to decide, I have a butter bread stolen from the breakfast here in the hotel. Thank you, by the way. Uh, so the, we do a small experiment now. Um, you know, when we drop the bread, it will fall on either of the sides. If, the fo if it drops on the butter side, we talk about neutrinos. If it does not fall on the butter side, I talk about the gravitational waves without slides, actually, then. So I need, unfortunately, a table, otherwise it won't work. <laughs> so we take this as table and we just let it fall. <laughs> and let's just do it slowly. Yeah? So this is roughly table height, I would say, yes. 
Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> we pretend it has fallen on the butter side. <laughs> I explain you why it didn't work. Yeah, so it, it's <laughs> so in principle, obviously, in the alternative universe, it would have fallen on the other side. I would be completely fine and explain you um, that we talk now about the neutrinos, which we will do anyway, uh, <laughs> obviously. So the, the, actually, we come back to the butter in, in one second, and we start with the bread and butter and Newton because this gives you a small introduction to why I like physics so much. So. Um, why is physics so cool? For many reasons. But the guy who really made most of the work was Newton. Um, not because of the apple, but because he was the one who realized that one can describe nature with math. We don't know why that is, but it works tremendously well, not only in physics, but in more or less all quantitative sciences. And um, in physics, even nicer, you typically make only very few very basic assumptions, and then it allows you to make a multitude of predictions. For example, that the butter bread should fall on the butter side. We'll come to that in a second, as said. Um, but Newton actually was much greater than this. He didn't only invent math, but he also understood that gravity is a phenomena which is, a phenomena which is universal. So in some sense, it makes not only falling the apple to the earth, but the moon um, and the sun and the earth orbiting around each other in, 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 certain, um, uh, in certain figures. And if you think about this, it's a completely non-trivial observation. I mean, for us, it's clear because we got taught this in the eighth grade in school, but go back a few hundred years and just realize that really this is the same force behind all of this. So that's why it's so uh, uh, um, tremendously great what he did. And with all of this um, Newton, Newtonian mechanics in principle, you should be able to derive that the um, butter bread falls always on the butter side. That's why I choose this topic. And so far, actually, it always worked until here. And I, I know why it didn't work here. No worries, I won't go through the math. Uh, the slides are online, so you can look at this later on. Actually, it's also a paper in EPJC published a few years ago from a guy. I think he won the um, um, IG Nobel Prize, you know, this. Yeah? I think it's a great paper. Um, <laughs> there's lots of nice math and, and, and derivation, so we don't go through this now. But what I would like to point out is, obviously, um, all of these predictions, they need experiments. I'm an experimental physicist, so obviously, I just take theories and try to test them. So they make predictions in my theories, and I test them. And without any correct predictions, the theory is completely worthless. Or differently said, when you have a theory which doesn't predict something which you can measure, it's also a kind of worthless theory uh, in, in my sense. Now, the derivation which we just saw and we didn't go through only applies for these assumptions, right? So it has to be a rectangular shape, which was not the case. Yeah? Um, then it only works for slow sandwiches or slow, slow butter breads. If you, if you can try this at home, and I did this many times, <laughs> when it's too fast, then the, the, the bread will fall always on the, on the right side. Uh, it will just sail down. Um, it only works for relatively six slices. If it's too small, then it's, it's dummy. And then it only works for relatively uh, soft bread. So you can try this with hard toast, it will just bounce back. Yeah. <laughs> so um, there are many, many assumptions which you have to make. So I guess the reason why this didn't work was it was not rectangular, rectangular shaped. Yeah. Then it, the 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 um, pre-moment. Okay, I forgot the English term. Um, um, is not correct there, and then it doesn't work. Unfortunately. Yeah. I should have prepared better, but there was no other bread <laughs> at the breakfast. Okay. Anyway. Um, so one more thing why physics is so cool. As I said, we start with very simple assumptions, and I would always like to highlight this lady here, this is Emmy Noether, um, because she realized um, some very fundamental concepts. So the first concept which she realized is, if you want that your theory of the universe is the same today and yesterday, yeah, or the day as uh, tomorrow, then automatically you have to require energy conservation. It just falls out of the math. And if you want that the physics is the same in Munich and Bonn, while I agree with many things my colleagues here in Munich do sometimes, um, in principle, the underlying physics should be the same. Once you assume this, you will get automatically out momentum conservation. So in principle, all the physics what we have is based on very simple assumptions, and then we try to explain the universe. That's pretty much it. Having said this, we finally can come to the neutrinos. So just we start with three, four slides on the, on the history of neutrinos, because I think it's a very nice story in many respects. So in the 30s, um, people realized that there's a problem with the so-called beta decay of, of uh, isotopes, or in, in more fundamentally speaking, you have the neutron which decays to a proton, as shown here, 
neutron goes to a proton, and this emits an electron, and obviously now we know there's also a neutrino involved, but the people at the time didn't know this. They just measured this thing here and this thing here. And from energy conservation, you know, in principle, the energy of the neutron must be somehow equal to the energy of the proton and the energy of the electron. And when you measure the electron of the electron, you realize that's not true. Yeah, that it just varies. And then Pauli came up with an assumption, with an idea how to explain this, and he postulated a new particle, which actually called a neutron at this time. Now it's called neutrino. And he said, well, this is also emitted, but we will never be able to detect it. And that's why he felt extremely uncomfortable um, um, to make this postulation, because he made a prediction which could not be tested. Our theory colleagues nowadays should be more cautious about this, yeah, because there are many things which can't be tested. Um, at that time, he really felt bad about it, and if you read this, actually, he was really concerned about this. Okay, so now he postulated this neutrino, which actually more or less never interacts. Um, and this, obviously, nowadays we know, is part of the standard model of particle physics, which explains essentially all the stuff which we see here around and which we cr can create so far on Earth. No worries, I won't go into all these details now, just two things. The neutrinos actually are playing here a part, so all these are neutrinos. And secondly, which you should take um, note of, that we have two kinds of particles, matter and antimatter. Okay? So this will be important in a second. Okay, so now, you know, in 2012, we discovered this guy here, the Higgs boson, and I guess you know this picture, it was a big celebration at CERN in 2012, and people said this was the last um, uh, missing piece of the standard model which have been um, discovered. Actually, I was fellow at the time at CERN. I woke up at this morning at 4.30 to try to get a place in the audience, and it was too late. I'm still, um, I'm still very unhappy about this. Uh, so I watched it as everybody else on YouTube, or I don't know which, which, which web service they had at that time. Um, the problem is, it's not true. The Higgs boson is not the last particle. One particle we never ever discovered, which most, most of, the th of my colleagues don't know, and this is the anti-tau neutrino. This guy here, we never discovered any reaction of this. We believe there have been some, but there have been never ever any experimental proof for this. So, um, since I like to do stuff which nobody did before, my goal will be in the next years, hopefully, to work um, together with my colleagues on the discovery of this, of this guy here. Okay, having said this, um, just some words why neutrinos are so special. So, um, assuming first they have no mass, yeah, uh, we will come to that in, also in a second, that's not true, but in the basic assumptions, they are massless particles, and they only interact with the weak interaction. What does this mean? So, the name already implies that it's weak, and this means really, really weak. If you're a neutrino, then you have a very, very lonely business. The chances are high that you travel your whole life through the universe and never, ever do anything. Um, that's obviously very, very rare. And just to give you an idea, only one out of 100 billion neutrinos who go through Earth interact. Yeah? All the others just go through and do nothing. Or differently said, when you would fill the universe with water, and then um, your neutrino and put it through, then 50% of your neutrinos will travel 60 light years without any interaction. Yeah? So that's why Pauli was already very afraid that this would never be able to be tested because the likelihood that inter neutrino interacts is, is super small. Obviously, there's a way out, and uh, the way out is you need many neutrinos, as we will see in a second. Now, there's one more thing. In the standard model, you assume that the neutrinos have no mass, but since 2001, we know with this experiment shown here that actually neutrinos have a mass. It's because of neutrino oscillations, lots of mass. We just assume now they have a mass. It's tiny, but it's there. The problem now is that in this mathematical formulation of the standard model, you can't write their mass term. It's well, you can't write there, but then it doesn't work anymore, right? So you can't do any predictions. Um, and that means we know already now, since neutrinos have a mass, there must be physics beyond the standard model, beyond our current understanding, to make this actually, um, to make this working. That's why so many people are fascinated by neutrinos, because for sure there is new physics. Um, so now, how to discover neutrinos? And also a little bit of history, because I find it quite funny. Um, as I just said, the likelihood that neutrinos are interacting is super small. So you need many, many neutrinos and hope one of them does something. So where to get many neutrinos from? And in the 50s, people have been a little bit more broader thinking, and they just thought, well, just we put a nuclear bomb, yeah, <laughs> let it explode, and then we build a detector in the, uh, around the Earth, and we just see, uh, try to check neutrinos. Now, finally, actually, this was approved. Yeah? <laughs> um, never conducted, because people realized there might be a better way. <laughs> 
And the better way is just to use a nuclear reactor, because also in a nuclear reactor, there are lots of neutrinos. So there, essentially, you, you place your detector next to a nuclear reactor. You hope for an anti-electron neutrino to come, which would create uh, anti-electrons or a positron when it interacts with matter. Sometimes it does. And then you just wait until your positron hits an electron and gets two photons out. You measure the energy of the two photons. That's super trivial, I think. There are only two people which do the measurement. It must be simple, right? And then you get a Nobel Prize. Yeah? Actually, they, they observed the neutrinos, and directly they write a telegram to Pauli saying, look, um, we found neutrinos. You have been right. This is a telegram. I wish I get such a telegram at some time. <laughs> I would be fine with an email. But <laughs> OK, so that's so much for the history. So now people knew that the neutrinos are there. And the idea behind this is we need many, many neutrinos. How to study neutrinos nowadays? Well, we can use the sun as neutrino source, because obviously the sun is big. Lots of nuclear stuff is happening inside. Lots of neutrinos come out. We can use astrophysical um, uh, sources, so something in the cosmos. Uh, and we have beam dump experiments. So you have a particle beam which you dump somewhere, and then also lots of neutrinos come out. Um, we have reactors also. For example, here, this is a Juno experiment uh, built in China, which also uses uh, some the same idea in some sense as a discovery. Um, of this poltergeist experiment, which I just showed you the uh, last slide before. And this one here is, for example, Ice Cube, where you study these um, astrophysical or cosmic neutrinos. And now we have one more source, which are these particle colliders. This is now new. And this is um, why I guess I'm invited. Apart from that I like Munich so much, it's fascinating to talk also about this. So let's start a little bit about collider physics. And I guess many of you know the one or other YouTube channel where the end of collider physics is already um, claimed since many years. So I will try to motivate now why I still think collider physics makes sense for the next decade. And I guess many of you know coding, and I have um, some coding examples to make clear some problems which we have in particle physics. So assume you would like to have a code which generates random, a random number. So I guess every, most of the people can code a little bit, right? So they can read this code. So this is done by ChatGPT, actually. I was not bothering to write this down. This is my ChatGPT answer to get a random number between, um, one, uh, between 0 and 1 million. You run the code, and you get this number. Perfectly fine. Now, assume you have an intern, or in my case, a PhD student or a student. Yeah? You ask to do this. He doesn't know about the routine of random. So he makes his own student code, does this, and you run the program and you get out zero. Now, who of you would say this code is wrong? Yeah? Important, you can only run it once. The student tells you zero comes out. Now, obviously, if you go there you know, from a pure um, likelihood view, you would say e both of them is equally likely. However, you know students or interns for that matter. Yeah? <laughs> And zero is a special number. You would wonder, I would wonder, I'm pretty sure I would say, look, you did something wrong. If, you, if zero comes out in the first trial, I'm pretty sure something is screwed up in your code. Obviously, I, can't, I don't have a hard proof, but I would bet my lunch and my dinner that something is wrong in his code. And that's something, the same thing what we have in, have in the standard model of particle physics. So we have several open, open issues there. The first thing, we have unanswered questions. For example, we can't explain why there is more matter than antimatter which is quite important because you are all matter, as far as I can tell, and there is no antimatter around for some reason. Then we have no idea why the masses of the particles which we have is so vastly different, orders of magnitude. We can't explain that. Fine, you might say it's not nice that you don't know things, but well, who cares, right? But then we have also hard evidence that something is, uh, must be wrong with the standard model, or at least it's not complete. And this is simply that we can't um, explain the kinematic behavior of galaxies. There might be evidence for something which we call dark matter. Could be something else. But for sure, it's not within the standard model. This I can tell you. The same is true for the expansion of the universe. For some reason, it accelerates. We can't explain that either. And then we come to that, what I call more aesthetic problems. For example, the value of the Higgs mass or the fact that the neutron doesn't have an um, a dip electric dipole moment. I don't want to go now in details here, but it's the same argument which I just made in the previous slide. Essentially, there are parameters in the standard model which are extremely close to zero or ex extremely special values. Yes, it can happen, but from all my experience, this is strange, okay? So the same thing you can say, yeah, yeah, the student might be have the right code here, but if zero comes out, it's, it gives you a bad taste. And this is what I call now aesthetic problems with the standard model. And that's why people thought it's a great idea to build a new accelerator I guess you know this picture of the LHC. I don't have to go um, into much detail. 
actually maybe just that I was living here <laughs> um, for quite a while. Um, and now, you know, it's 100 meters underground, 27 kilometers long, and we just collide protons and other protons at extremely high collisions to get high energies. And the basic idea behind this is that we um, try to create the new particles which have been not created so far in the lab. And so this would be the direct search for new physics. The other idea is we measure processes which we can calculate extremely precisely and then measure those. And if the two things don't match up, there are two reasons. First of all, I measured wrongly. Okay, or the theoretician calculated wrongly, or the exciting one, that something is new, which we didn't understand. So far, this was not successful, and this was not successful either. Um, so far, yeah? The basic idea of the experiment is rather simple. You have your collisions here, and then you just build around a detector, which takes a picture of this. And then, in some sense, you just analyze a picture afterwards. So, um, this is one of the pictures of my favorite experiment, Atlas. It's huge, so if you are coming to Geneva once, I can recommend to come there in the winter break. Then you can go down, or you come there after 26, 2026, then you can also go down. Yeah, so you just have to register there. They take, I think they take four, four weeks roughly before, and you can go down and look at this. It's just amazing. Um, I just, uh, I love it. Yeah. Okay, so now um, let's come back to the Atlas and slowly uh, let's work towards the neutrinos. So in the beginning of the 2000s, the general feeling was that the new physics must be heavy. Heavy means that the particles which are new must have a large mass. And the reason for that is not completely crazy, because people knew the Higgs boson will be heavy, the top quark was just discovered, that's very heavy, and many ideas of new physics or new um, uh, models which can explain these unanswered questions involve new, um, involve, uh, new heavy particles. So the thing is, new heavy particles, when they create it, they fly in all directions. How can you understand this? Well, this is an AI-generated picture, and I said, please show me a Lego collision of two trains, yeah, and what comes out. So what you should see here is, these are two Lego trains which have been crashing, and then the Lego particles fly in all directions. That's the basic idea of this, right? And now the idea is you just um, try to build a detector around it and collect all these Lego parts and then try to figure out what happened in this collision. There's one important difference. Light particles will not fly in all directions. They will fly mainly in the directions of the incoming beam or in the incoming train. You can imagine this a little bit. Assume here's a train coming, and you have here a small Lego part, and when they collide, well, this Lego part will just fly in the direction of the train further, right? The problem now is that with the current detectors, we can't see this. Why? Well, assume the protons here, the protons here, then obviously there's a pipe and there's a pipe where they get, you know, flying around, so there can't be a detector because there's a pipe, and that means when you have a new particle created, then this might just fly in the direction of the pipe further, and it's gone forever. So in some sense, um, when you try to look for new physics, which does not create heavy particles, but light particles, you have to think of something different. And that's where the phaser experiment comes into the game. The idea was simply, let's build a detector far downstream of the collision point, and just see what we see there. And luckily, there are lots of service tunnels, tunnels around the LHC. So what you see here is Atlas. This is not uh, on scale, yeah? And here is the um, LHC tunnel, and the basic idea is you have new particles which are light and not charged. They obviously will be produced and just fly very straight there. And you just have to build a detector here. That's it. Um, and that's what we see here. So this is the LHC here, and here is phaser now put in such that it looks to the um, Atlas interaction point. And there we try now to find these um, new particles which are very light. What's the basic idea of phaser? No worries, we don't go into details. This is just a schematical check, uh, uh, um, uh, sketch of how it looks like. This thing here to looks towards the interaction point. So here come our new particles. We have here essentially just uh, steel plus a little bit of stuff, I'll tell you later. We have here some detectors, we have here magnets, and we have a calorimeter here. So everybody who is particle physicist or astroparticle physicist knows how this in principle works. Everybody else, just believe me, it works, okay? Uh, it will be now too long to explain this in detail. So once you have the idea, obviously what's missing? Money. So who pays for this? 
So I have two rules which I discovered now during my career in, in, in academics. The first rule of funding is all ideas are nice until the point you ask for money. Then people will tell you it's not a good idea, right? So um, the same happens here. So, um, so you have to bring your costs down always. And one idea which we essentially did at Facer was we tried to re reuse as much as possible leftover components from other experiments. So our complete tracking detectors have been in-kind contributions from Atlas, leftover stuff, the colorometer is from LHCB, also leftover stuff. Still, we need some money. And there, we have been lucky that one of the proposals of the experiments, uh, Jonathan here, he, had, uh, he is in the US, and he got contact to the uh, Heisen Simons Foundation. Both of them are, I think, physicists and mathematicians who got extremely rich at Wall Street and they fund crazy ideas. So they put money on the table, uh, some initial money. And this is, brings me to my, fast, uh, to my second um, uh, funding rule in science. Once there's money on the table, then it's much easier to get more money on the table. Yeah? So when one person convinced that it's a good idea to invest, the others follow. I would recommend in the end, please do this also, because then you can go down to the tunnel and have a look. So this year is um, uh, Heising, I think. Um, and he was there last year. It was quite an effort to bring him here because, well, he's already quite old and you have to climb over all these things. But he uh, obviously enjoyed it and we have been very happy to get the initial money uh, from his foundation. So once we got the money, it doesn't, doesn't take long to install stuff which is already built up. Yeah, so this is just pictures from the installation in this tunnel. It's super crowded and very small because the experiment compared to Atlas is not big. It's just maybe three, four meters long. It's rather small. And the final picture you see here, obviously, is a PR picture. No? Nobody works like this, yeah? but it looks amazingly nice. And then after about one year of, of um, setup during COVID, actually, um, we have been done. What I like most about it is that I made it myself to the tunnel. I've been there only once before, but never like this inside. So I'm extremely, I was extremely grateful to have this experience. But it's, it, it looks on the picture much cooler than it, than it is in reality. If you go via subway, it's the same thing. It's just a tunnel, right? <laughs> With a blue pipe inside. But the lights are nice and OK. Anyway, so the original idea of Phaser did not involve neutrinos at all. We wanted to look for particles which are new, which are light, and we did, don't know about them before. So one thing could be we could look for dark photons or for something which we call axion-like particles. So this actually is the stuff where I got my funding for. A signature is super simple. So you expect, actually, you should see nothing in your detector and we add some energy here. So when, when you do this and you see there's something, then you get a Nobel Prize. It's fantastic in principle. The problem is there's only um, there's one background. And the background which we have here dominantly is neutrinos, because they make a very similar signature when they interact. And once you realize that actually your background is neutrinos, then why not trying to measure these neutrinos directly and not only as background. And that's the basic idea which was put there. So how to discover um, neutrinos at the colliders? And let me check how we're doing in the time, because I don't want to stand between you and the uh, uh, lunch. Um, let's, go, let's go on. Neutrinos at phaser. The basic idea is that we make use of these 60 million proton-proton collisions at the LHC per second. There will be many neutrinos produced, electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, tau neutrinos, and we just need to put some heavy stuff in front of the detector where the neutrinos can interact. And the heavy stuff is tungsten or Wolfram. Essentially, it's just the metal which is super dense. Yeah? That's the basic idea. What you see here is this tungsten thing. There's more inside, but it's essentially only tungsten. And then it's very simple. So what you do is um, the, no the neutrinos come from this direction, and you have here a, a trigger which checks if any charged particles come in. Nothing must come, nothing. The neutrinos fly obviously through, and if you're lucky, one of them creates here a signature. And then you see the signature in the following detectors. So essentially, you see something appearing out of nothing, when you do this, then you, uh, congratulations, you saw a neutrino. It's super trivial analysis. It's just cut and count. Yeah? So no neural networks, nothing. It's just really simple. That's always nice. So um, why is that cool to see a neutrino? Well, just first, here are some, some random plots which should convince you that we did our things correctly. We can discuss them later if you're interested, or you can just believe me. So now we have observed um, neutrinos before in the reactors, beam times cosmos, and the sun and now also at colliders. So what's so special about it? Well, for me, two things. First of all, I'm now here, and because we've got lots of publicity about it, 
And is there anything more? Mm, yeah. <laughs> Um, but that's not as cool as you might think. Yeah, so um, um, what can we learn about this? So these neutrinos at the LHC are extremely high energies, but not as high as we see from the cosmos. So this, the guys at Ice Cube at this, um, at this telescope in the, at the South Pole, they have extremely high energy neutrinos. The people at the reactors have very low energy neutrinos. And finally, we at LHC directly are in, exactly in the middle. Yeah, so we can, this is measured before, this is measured before, here this is new. And there actually we can really contribute. And actually we can also distinguish different kinds of neutrinos, electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and maybe, as I will tell you in a second, also tau neutrinos. So you, you learn in some sense about how neutrinos interact with matter, and that's important to interpret the data which we get from the astrophysical observations. We can even learn more when we can distinguish electron neutrinos from muon neutrinos and from tau neutrinos. And how you do this, this, now you have to follow me a bit. What you see here is essentially this tungsten. Here the neutrino comes in, also here, and then at this point and this point it reacts, the simulation obviously. Yeah? So you see this stuff here below is just stuff from the neutron or the proton which was hit by the, by the neutrino. It's just flying in there. Then the neutrino creates, if it's a muon neutrino, it creates a muon. This is the track which you see here. If it's an electron neutrino, it creates an electron. And you already can see by pure eye that the signatures in the detector will look different. The muon is just a straight line. The electron is things which is shower shaped like. So like bloop, things fly out. And this obviously is a way to handle or just to distinguish the electron neutrinos from tau neutrinos. So we can make a tick here and a tick here, those we measured. Let's, let's discuss the tau neutrinos um, in a second. First, let me just explain how you measure these things here, and that's actually quite fascinating. So I told you, you put there in the beginning of phaser, so here, um, essentially only tungsten, yeah, so Wolfram. That's not sure, obviously I was lying. What you use is one millimeter tungsten, and then um, uh, 200 micrometers photofilm. And the older generation of you, as myself, you still remember that there have been films in the previous times, yeah? So you have tungsten, then you put a photofilm there, then tungsten, photofilm, tungsten, photofilm. The nice thing about the photofilm is that there's an incredible good resolution. It's really on nanometer level where you can see charged particles going through. So what you do is you put the tungsten, photofilm, tungsten, photofilm, and you make this over above roughly, um, roughly one meter. And this you put in front. And you put it in and you leave it there for a few months and you take it out and then you just develop all these films. And then you try to reconstruct. So that's a really hard problem. So there you need a little bit of AI because there are many, many combinatorics which you can get. But since the resolution is so high, actually you can, you can do this. So the advantage is clear, it's super precise and it's relatively cheap. But there are many disadvantages. I mean, first of all, who has still photographic films? There's only one, more, one company <laughs> in Japan who still does this. That's it. Yeah? Um, then um, the scanning of these films, this takes ages. I mean, it's, it's, I mean this is so high precision, it takes oh, years. And then you have to replace these films every few months, which is actually quite expensive. I mean, ex to develop them not, but to place them again there because there's only one company. It's just, it's a nightmare, but it works. And this might be the, the key to get the anti-tau neutrino. So how does a tau neutrino interaction look like? That's unfortunately much more complicated. You have a tau neutrino coming in, you get a tau lepton, and the tau lepton is not stable, it decays sooner or later in other stuff. For example, as you see here in pions, or if you're lucky into muons. So this is shown here. Anti-tau neutrino reacts, you get stuff from the proton and neutron, you get the tau and then a muon out. And that's a trick, because you know that there's a kink, this king tells it was a tau neutrino, or a tau decay, then you know it was a tau neutrino, and you can measure the charge of the neutrino. And that gives you the information you need, because the charge of the, uh, sorry, the charge of the muon, the charge of the muon if it's negative, then the tau must be negative, and then it's a, no, a tau neutrino. If the charge of the muon is positive, then this must be positive, the tau here, and it was an anti-tau neutrino. So the only thing what we have to do is, we have to find um, these, anti uh, these neutrino interactions and then measure the charge of the muons which come out. So um, my bet is that we discover these anti-tau neutrinos in the next six, seven years, because unfortunately we're not the only group who's working on this, they're also competitors, so it's a, it's a race. Now is this a major breakthrough? If we discover them, then obviously not, everybody expects them, yeah? 
if we don't discover them, that's, that's groundbreaking. Yeah? So <laughs> this would be absolutely amazing. And in any case, I would hope that when we discover them, I can come back in six, seven years to tell you if that worked or not. OK, so let me spend the last five minutes on the future of phase and the LHC. So obviously, um, we run much longer until the 2030s, and we will expect to uh, take at least four times more data, which allows us to make many fantastic things. Um, maybe we find a new particle. Maybe we discover the anti-tau neutrino. And for sure, we understand much, much more about the strong interaction or quantum chromodynamics. Um, then maybe one more slide about the future of collider physics. I think the situation which we have right now is quite un unsatisfactory, simply because we know that there must be something beyond the standard model. This is clear. There is no dispute about this. The problem is there are much more ideas on the market than we can ever test, and some of the ideas are, are great. So I just gave a lecture in, in Bonn for, for, for master students about supersymmetry and gut theory. So if the physicist of you know, yeah, and many people say supersymmetry is that. I would also agree it's kind of that. But when you read again the theory, it's just so beautiful, it's just, it's just a shame that it's not true. Um, the, problem is, the problem is that some parts of the theories will never be able to rule out completely simply because the parameter space of them is too large. This is also very unsatisfactory. Maybe, maybe we, our, our math which we have right now is, or the formulation which we have right now is completely wrong and we need something new. So I think it's clear from experimental physicists, and I, it's clear that I have to say this, our theory friends, they need guidance, and that means they need, they need new experiments. This is for me completely clear. Um, so that brings me up to the crucial question of all of this stuff, funding. So I'm extremely happy to be, be here because typically I speak to my colleagues, which is kind of not boring, but you know, they, I know them, they know me, it's not. Um, I never have, the uh, never have the chance typically to talk to taxpayers, so many, many thanks. So this is not my research, it's our research, because in the end you paid for this, yeah? So it's, it, I, it, I'm not making this up, I'm really grateful for this, uh, for this that you do this. If you happen to be rich, yeah? <laughs> and you simply do not know what to do with your money, I have some great ideas, yeah? <laughs> Among them, there are the two things. So if you, if you, um, um, uh, or, or if you own a company, hmm, uh, same thing, um, you can do two things. You can buy your own professor. Yeah, I'm rather cheap, I must say. Um, <laughs> but no, but they're, they're, really, they're, they're really programs where companies can set up professorships at universities. They just give their income contribution. This goes to a fund. On, on the stock market and from the revenues the professor is financed. I guess you can argue to get your name on this professor, yeah? on the chair at least. Or you can finance your own particle physics experiment. I have many great ideas. My colleagues have two. Yeah? We don't need so much money. Yeah? Um, so believe me, I can build three experiments out of the funding which you spent here on this venue. <laughs> no, <laughs> no worries, I love it. Yeah, you should do this more often. I'm just saying when there's some left over, <laughs> let's have a chat afterwards. Um, and this brings me already to the uh, end. I didn't want to beg for money. The, ma the main point was really, really to thank you for paying taxes. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so um, let's, let's get back to the takeaway messages. Neutrino at Del C is a new tool to study the strong interaction. Yeah? It's not as cool as you might think. We discovered something fundamentally new. It's just a new tool to do something. The anti-tau neutrino was never discovered. Yeah? If you talk to the average public physicist, he will tell you everything is known. This is not true. This is not seen so far. I think it's great. It's still fun. I really love my work. Um, so um, if you are bored, if you have a sabbatical and want to do something, write me. I'm sure we find a small project if you want to do this too. It's just fun. And I think we live in highly interesting times because there are so many unanswered questions. And this is the end of my talk. And we have still five minutes to, uh, for questions. Uh, or you can go to lunch, as you wish. <laughs> Thank <clears throat> you.